Hi, time for some more expensive lab equipment to uh, take apart and have a look at. This is a flow cytometer, which is basically for looking at things like cells. It, it flows the cells through a very sort of small gap, fires a laser at it, and then looks at fluorescence from sort of dye markers that have been added to it beforehand to see what's you know, what's in it, what you know, what state it's in, and so on. I think it's used for like medical research. Don't know if they use it for diagnosis, but it's sort of basically for looking at your know, cellular type based stuff. About the size of a laser printer, um, not much to see on the outside, there's a few bits missing, so this car, this is just an, an air vent, um, it's missing, so there's a vent on the other side, and there's a bunch of connectors on the bottom mains input, this sort of fly lead coming out. There's another module that goes with this, which is, I think it's called a sheath management system, which manages the fluid and the, the fluid that the cells are suspended in and the vacuum for sucking stuff out afterwards. But I don't have that, so um, those clearly just plug into those multi-pin connectors. So this thing uh, isn't very useful on its own. And the top hinges up, reveal some uh, optical goodness. And this very uh, sexy looking, sort of engraved, anodized aluminium cover. So if we take this cover off we can see a little bit more. Now there's three lasers, unfortunately this laser's missing, this is a 488 nanometer laser which wasn't here, this this looks like one or two parts have been sort of robbed maybe to fix another machine. So I think about 408 nanometer laser here and there's a red laser here, there's some motorized beam blockers here, so this one, um, the beam path will go through here and then through a little hole in here, this one comes up here and then reflects into here and there's one here that fires straight into this uh, cell. And there's the back of here, and the back here we've got 10 photomultiplier modules. These are sort of complete modules with a high voltage power supply amplifier and photomultiplier tube. So the light goes in here and then it goes out the back there and then into this detector array and there's a load of um, and there's various filters that you can drop into these slots which uh, sort of reflect light sort of from this path into each detector and all those are missing not surprisingly i think those are mostly like notch filters to notch out the um wavelength of the laser so it's looking for the fluorescence from the um that the laser's producing in the sample all right let's take a detailed look around here um, this is the actual flow cell, we'll obviously get into that a bit later. Um, looking at some of the labelling, uh, there is a camera in here somewhere as well, but there's, it is outputting video, but I'm not seeing anything, so it probably needs the light, some light and some samples to actually see anything. So we've got a red laser here, um, that's some sort of sensor, maybe a light sensor. Uh, we've got these, these um, modules, these are photomultiplier modules from Hamamatsu, who else? Interesting, there's a board in here that's actually got nothing plugged into it. I think it's been changed at some point. Looking at the dates, cause this um, this uh, coherent cube laser's got a date of um, 2013, but there's a date of 2006 on the main unit, so clearly that's been um, retrofitted. This is the connector for the laser that's missing. On the back here, and on the back here we've got this assembly as a power supply and this board which I think is for laser control because there's various labels. So uh, 408 cube, 408 sapphire, again sapphire is another coherent um, laser brand name and that, that goes down to this board on, on the back here which I think this is the controller for this uh, non-present laser. 405 compass and again compass is another um, coherent product line. And as we come around here we've got um, a PXI little rack unit. PXI is a standard for instrument test, test equipment and instrumentation that has a backplane which is basically the PCI bus over different um, connectors. So you can sort of build up a rack with all your various data acquisition and other things as a test system that then talks over a PCI bus. And here we've got a um, an MXI4 card. An MXI4 is a high-speed serial bus which is designed for bridging PCI buses. So the other end of that cable um, is the one that's hanging out the back. This will plug into a card on the PC to bridge to the PC's own PCI bus. So all the stuff in this rack can be accessed as if it was a PCI card plugged into the PC. At the PC itself and also there's a there's another um, National Instruments card here which is a general um, IO controller providing a whole load of IO ports here and there's some cards here which are custom for this in instrument because the uh, it's got the manufacturer Deco Cytomation and these are all the inputs from the photomultipliers there's an amplifier and then data acquisition um, cards here and just a power supply and here we've got a board that's just doing all sorts of various interfacing and um, this is going to be sort of solenoid drivers for the various fluidics. These are all the power supplies for the photomultipliers. There's, a, uh, there's another power supply down there. And 
and on this side we've got the various fluidic stuff there's a little manifold with a um, load of solenoid valves here there's a uh, what's marked an i slash p converter this is a um, 4 to 20 milliamp current controlled pressure valve um, it says sort of input 4 to 20 milliamps output uh, 3 to 15 psi so that's sort of, sort of programmable pressure regulator because obviously if you're sort of trying to get a flow through something then the actual pressures need to be controlled carefully to get the right flow rate uh, this is the bit where the sample actually goes there's this sort of lever here that pulls down then there's um this tube that you put your sample in stick it on there there's a sort of sample tube here so you sort of stick that in and stick that move that across to hold it in place and down here there's a little section on a, there's a sort of transparent section which I'm guessing maybe to be uh, so you can actually see if there's any bubbles or blockage and perhaps you can actually take that off to get access to here but obviously uh, there's sort of some specific access required for this um, this area which again there's various sort of tubes coming in we'll go into this in a bit more detail but that's, that's obviously part of all the flow control and fluid getting the right um, amount of fluid going through it uh, there's a couple of uh, detachable fluid valves that go, go off to the um, that fluid connector on the back. Press that and these just uncouple. And this is the the, uh, the base looks like it's sort of two stainless steel plates with a sort of compartment which I think is actually filled with resin. There's a little hole in the side that looks like there's actually resin so to provide sort of mecha a very mechanically stable um, platform because obviously this is doing sort of optical stuff so you probably don't want any um, vibration but again I've not seen that before it's sort of a, a sort of section in the middle and these sort of two plates that which are I think those are actually bonded rather than welded together and then there's obviously the usual fairly chunky pieces of aluminium on there and also on here sort of about a pretty it's about sort of 10 mil thick aluminium this is the actual flow cell this cover looks like it's sort of meant to be user removal because it's got flat slotted screws rather than the usual um, obligatory allen screws that we always see on lab equipment it's got this little um, viewing port here and we've got the three laser inputs so we've got the, um, the violet coming through here the green here and then the red one going through there and there's some optics at the back which send, sends the light back down to the um, photomultipliers and we've got this nice funky um, anodized plate engraved which is uh, somewhat cosmetic but uh, I suppose this is a fairly expensive piece of kit so people like to see uh, these nice finishes going on take this off not a huge amount to see here there's sort of some sort of chamber I don't I don't know which way the fluid goes I'm guessing it probably comes up through here and this is probably the waste path there's like a little chamber here with a sort of no ring seal in the top taking this out underneath here there's a um, just a right angled mirror I'm fairly sure that's the camera so it's looking sort of in this direction and there's a lens underneath here sort of focusing the output from the uh, the flow cell back towards the photomultipliers down here there just looks like some sort of pinholes and taking this off there's just like a little o-ring I think this is just a, a right angle flow thing and the teeny tiny little pinhole here so that's probably the top of the flow the actual flow cell no okay so it looks like this all comes apart this is the lens okay so this camera module comes out so it's a cheap connector to be used in this sort of kit three and a half mil jack and then like a <laughs> nice little coax thing that's an interesting uh, combination to finding something like this this assembly comes so this holds the um, the optics for the laser there's a red filter there for that laser these are just lenses blue and greens and there's looks like there's a cylindrical lens there if that's a diode laser um, diode lasers tend to have sort of rectangular beam shape so that's probably just to um, get the red beam down to a smallest uh, possible spot and this there's a couple of uh, filters in here to a great um, it's about 10 mil diameter large area photodiode which will be just sensing the the absolute light levels because in something like this you need to know what your light levels are Although interestingly it doesn't appear to be any intensity control on um, either of these lasers I'm a bit surprised they don't want to control the um, the laser power they just seem to maybe they're just doing it by measuring or maybe it's not that critical I don't know enough about the um, the process to know how important that is but it's a bit surprising that there's just they don't appear to have any uh, power control on these that sort of fairly narrow band blue that one I think is just a uh, 
neutral density filter. So here's the actual flow cell. There's this um, yellowy plastic which looks like it's a sort of concentric nozzle arrangement. You've got sort of one one um, small tube going up the middle, which I think is the actual sample, and then you've got this. You can see this sort of conical shape, which I think is producing um, sort of a liquid sheath around that sample. I don't know if that actually draws the uh, the sample through the tube or if it's just. You know, I don't quite know the exact um, details of the fluidics. But so this is this is the actual cell, which is a piece of um, glass. And there's a tiny hole all the way through, just sort of poking bits of wire through it. I think it's probably about a quarter of a millimetre in diameter, that hole through the um, the middle. And then there's this lens, which looks like it's actually moulded in. Could be glued on, but I can't see any sign of any sort of join on there. So that might actually be moulded and or sort of machined in one piece, which uh, is quite an interesting process. I'd be interested to know how you drill a 0.2mm, 2.5mm hole through a piece of glass, if anyone happens to know. But yeah, that's the actual flow cell, and so obviously that provides the focus down to the, the point where the cells are actually flowing uh, flowing through. And taking this apart, we can see, so this is the actual um, needle that injects the sample in, and we've got this just conical section, so the um, it gets surrounded by whatever fluid is um, coming coming through this section into the, um, into the flow cell. Just fine adjustments that set the exact position of the cell within here, so that's presumably to make it hit hit the lasers and line up with the um, photo detectors so there's, there's some sort of fairly precision XY adjustment to this whole assembly and this is one of those uh, beam blockers sort of rotary solenoid with a sort of spring back and little rubber bumper Actually, there is actually a little section in there and there's this is the one from the blue laser you can actually see here that blue sort of violet laser looks like it's actually bleached the anodizing you actually see that little uh, mark on the back obviously this is a sort of cavity for the laser to get dumped into now this is the one for the green one it does actually have some very slight marks beam marks on it and obviously there's um grooves here there's probably acts a little bit heat sinking um for when it's used for more powerful lasers this um i think the blue is 100 milliwatts i'd imagine the green's probably in a similar sort of league so this isn't producing any serious amount of heat but obviously this is a general purpose sort of beam been blocking type product so it's going to be uh, designed for use with high power lasers as well and not surprisingly no sign of any marks at all on the red one so attention to detail the uh, cables for it for these three uh, sh uh, shutters are actually color coded according to the, uh, the laser color which is nice and the camera module is just a pretty bog standard board cctv camera and log output um, I'm pretty sure this is just used for alignment, not any actual measurement. It's pointing at this, sort of three tiny little holes going into the photomultiplier assembly and obviously this white background. So, you know, you connect this up to a monitor and then do all the adjustments to actually get the, um, the light going through these holes. For some reason they've used this crappy little three and a half mil uh, plug for power rather than something a bit more fitting for the sort of cost of this thing. Which seems a little bit, bit of an odd choice. Maybe it was the only thing they could fit in that space. Right, moving on to the photomultiplier block. There's this here where the um, we've, got, we've got these three little pinholes, and I wonder if these three actually correspond to the different wave, laser wavelengths. I think wonder if perhaps they um, they aim sort of each laser at a slightly different position that comes that comes to a different uh, point here. So you can simultaneously look at the um, the results of those three different wavelengths in the back of here there's some prisms that just basically sort of take the, the center one goes straight through and the side one sort of divert sideways so if we just sort of put some light through there you can see we've got the center one coming through here then we've got the um the top and bottom ones these then just go through these uh, lenses into the photomultiplier block and then there's various different mirrors and filters that drop into here obviously the, unfortunately these are all missing so that could sort of take the light and sort of fire it sideways and it then gets directed into whichever photomultiplier you're interested in. It's like there's sort of six along the back and there's four on the front and these are probably set up, set up at different heights to go onto one of these uh, three tracks. Now this is one side of the photomultiplier module so we've got these apertures and there's a lens for the uh, which of those three tracks that it's picking the, um, the light off of. And these are just sort of basically completely self-contained photomultiplier with a high voltage power supply and some amplification. So you just sort of give them power that you can actually control. There's external control of the high voltage if you want it. So it's just sort of like a completely uh, modular, very uh, low light um, detector module. And it's just a sort of plus minus 12 volt supply, voltage control input, and the output is via these uh, coax connectors. 
Now these come in various flavours sort of for sensitivity to um, different wavelengths with different um, window materials and photocathodes. Unfortunately these are potted so I can't uh, go inside them but they're not, probably not going to be too, uh, too exciting. The thing I don't quite understand is they, they're fixed in with nylon screws. don't quite understand why they would have done that whether everything else is um, yeah, normal machine screws. I can't think why they would do that. There doesn't seem to be any sort of electrical insulation as far as I can tell. I don't quite understand why uh, you know why we'll use weak nylon screws just for these right that's all the stuff off the top deck let's see what's underneath so here this is just a general sort of io board it's got like drivers of solenoid valves various bits of interfacing this cable this goes to that multi-way connector on the back and then this one here goes to the pxi multi io card fortunately a lot of the plugs are labeled so you can actually get a bit of information about what's doing what there's also loads of power supply stuff here as well temperature sensor bubble detector it would be interesting to see i'm guessing that's probably some sort of opto sensor across the tube cover board so transistors driving the solenoid valves supplies to the um, photomultipliers, these include a, um, a control voltage to set the HV value, which presumably controls the sensitivity, and just sort of loads of power stuff. Some, um, it's a few op amps, some LM324 op amps, some bus drivers, that's all pretty straightforward. Down here, we've got a little 12 volt power supply. It also looks like it's taking power from the uh, the PXI rack power supplies as a supply in this rack. There's a couple of fans down here just blowing air through this rack. Right, let's take a look at this uh, fluidic section. Um, all these various uh, valves and stuff plugs into this little breakout board. This just connects down to that main interface board. And it gives us a bit of a clue as to what these are. We've got sort of all the various labels on here. There's a, a lead for each one, which is also used for debugging. Anti-back EMF diode, because these are all uh, inductive loads. So we've got sample shield waste, fax sense, sheath sense, lever micro switch, sample pressure regulator, sample air vent valve, sample pinch valve, sample tube waste valve, debubble valve, lower waste valve and waste valve. And a lot of these valves do actually have labels saying what they are, which is uh, nice. Okay, so this is the assembly that goes into the sampling tube. The sample tube itself actually seals into this block. There's an O-ring here and there's various um, pathways. One is to the, this outer part. I'm, I imagine they probably pump either liquid or air into there to actually force the sample up into this central tube. And the central tube is actually coaxial. There's like an outer tube and then this inner one with an extremely fine hole through the middle of it um, guessing it's yeah, of the yeah, 0 0.2.3 millimetre of that sort of order um, there's a valve on the side as well between two of these um, two of these sections and so this goes in the top here so I think this tube connects to that, that centre one and then there's another path to the, the outer bit so I'm not sure the exact sort of fluid pathway but obviously it's pumping some some up one tube and one up the other perhaps one's a pressure relief because so i think there's only one output from this so perhaps one's just like a bypass or something can't really be bothered to trace all this out to figure out what's going on that i think is just a, a one-way valve and put, actually it might be an air filter for incoming air oh yes there's sample air there's a valve down there there's a manifold here with there's a debubble. Oh, perhaps the um, the two tubes. There's things saying debubble, so perhaps they um, do some flowing stuff to avoid bubbles in the sample. There's, all the, there's also this photo sensor. This um, looks into the sort of towards the top of the tube. So again, that's so I think that's going to be the bubble sensor. It says TPS sensor. Whatever that means. So perhaps that's just sensing either bubbles or or the actual liquid level in the um, the sample tube. And so there's this. Uh, this manifold that's just squirting stuff in various directions and down here there's a couple of pressure switches there's like a sort of diaphragm here with a, a micro switch so these are probably just like over pressure and under pressure sensing all the actual pressure and vacuum is coming from that external unit um, which we don't have the I thought we call the sheath management system that's in a, another box it's actually a tube going to this um, retaining thing but I suspect that's probably just a waste for anything that sort of dribbles out of here there's a hole there that just collects it and it drains off so it doesn't go all over your uh, table tubes going to this this is where the um you know, the sample tube just sits here there's one down here which is, this is just clearly a drain but there's also a one at the top I can only imagine that's maybe just some sort of thing for rinsing this out I can't think why else you'd have a um a hole there 
So I've not come across one of these um, controllable pressure valves before. I've just hooked, hooked it up, just a power supply, and it sort of seems to do, do what you'd expect. And I was sort of kind of expecting something sort of vaguely clever and complicated, but it is literally just a two-wire interface. So I wonder if this is actually just something like a sort of some sort of diaphragm, almost maybe like a speaker cone, that as yeah the, the current actually just produces some force acting against the pressure with some sort of clever bypass pneumatics to actually uh, control the pressure. So, so take a quick look inside. It's actually surprisingly little in this thing. We've got this. This is an adjustment screw that turns this this direction we've got a um, multi-turn pot here that's marked range so that's probably just connected across the coil to adjust the current to pressure characteristic oh that's a zero adjust and then there's this assembly here there is a fairly strong magnet on here there. oh there's some very very fine wires going to a coil that's interesting yeah this is sort of a sort of very fairly delicate spring spring mechanisms i think this is just using the force from the, uh, the a coil and the magnet to just apply some force to a diaphragm to provide some pressure regulation i'm not going to take this any further apart it looks a bit fragile but uh, it's quite interesting as i suspected this uh, unconnected pcb is a laser controller um, on the back it says uh, compass 405 and the compass is a, was an old range of coherent um, dpss lasers and as we saw the uh, the purple laser had a date code after the manufacturing date of this obviously they took the compass laser out put the um the cube one in and just left the uh, controller in place nothing exciting on there just power supply stuff thermoelectric cooler driver in this can the rest is just power a little free scale micro and this is the uh, laser power module we've got uh, another one these little 12 volt power supplies ball with some regulators and so there's connector options for various lasers and on the other side we've got the uh, controller this is for the um the carrier and sapphire laser that's missing and there's nothing too exciting on these boards there's a sort of processor and just some analog stuff here so this would have been doing things like controlling the thermoelectric thermo coolers regulating the diode current that sort of stuff there's say some um, power supply stuff here and again all pretty much what you'd expect to find on a solid state laser controller okay let's take a look at this uh, pxi rack so there's a small rack with a pci bus along the back i'm sure you can probably get like full pc cars to make these uh, standalone systems but as i mentioned before this is bridged to the um pci bus on a pc using this um mxi4 interface um, these are really nice. There's the screw retaining screws, but there's also these nice latch things where you sort of release the latch and then pull it and it levers the card out. It's very uh, quite satisfying. And the fact you've got this push release and this and the screws means these aren't going to uh, come out of their own accord. Um, this is just a power supply, just a 30 box standard supply. So 250 watts. So quite a nice. Um, Sort of turn pin back plane connections sort of mains down there and some high current stuff here and this is the national instruments mxi4 interface i think i saw somewhere it's about one and a half gigabit interface to bridge between um two pci buses it looks like there's a footprint here which i'd imagine is probably for a fiber optic option this uses sort of a couple of twisted pairs down um on this uh, d connector and putting the heat sinks off this is a um a agilent hdmp 1022 and 1024 chipset which is designed as a an easy to use or parallel to serial conversion um, solution so the idea is you've got a, a parallel uh, bus up to 21 bits wide on one end it does all the serialization and encoding decoding and then you just get those same 21 bits coming out the other end of the um receiver as uh, a xilinx spartan fpga and just a load of bus, bus buffers on there and that's the connector for the um, PCI bus. So that's some uh, keying options to uh, only allow certain connectors to be plugged into certain slots. This is the other National Instruments card. This is just general I.O. And this is the first of two types of custom board. These take the analog voltage inputs from the photomultipliers. Also some analog signal conditioning stuff. Uh, on the back there's some digital isolators and these are going this direction. So these are probably going to transferring various control signals from this side to control maybe gain control or signal switching um there's some analog multiplexers here but this isn't converted on the on this board this actually goes out this socket and then there's a um rj45 jumper to the uh, data acquisition boards which are the other custom boards and also there's a load of power supply uh, stuff on that and this is the actual data acquisition board uh, quite a lot on here buffers there 
some 14 bit 25 mega sample per second HD converters and some FIFO memories, a couple of TI DSPs, a PCI interface chip, and a small, um, small Altera CPLD, and of course, power stuff. Not really much on the other side. It's surprising they sort of went for this custom stuff. PXI is a fairly sort of standard test equipment um, platform. It's surprising they sort of had to do this rather than use it being able to buy something off the shelf for doing this uh, data acquisition. And finally, there's this board here. I think this is just pulling some power off, and there's a trigger out connection. And the world's most underwhelming PXI board. Just some power filtering. And that's basically it. There's also some connections that go straight to the um, back plane here. You can see the via stitching and some uh, unusual uh, typeface on there. Maybe whoever did this was just get, got really bored with doing such a simple board, so they decided they wanted to at least put it, give it a uh, funky typeface. Nothing on the back. And lastly, we've got this cute little um, laser. This is, this is 407 nanometers, 50 milliwatts. So it's like a fairly sort of deep purple. It looks actually a bit pale, paler blue on camera than it does. It actually, it's sort of quite a purple colour. So obviously you can do the normal sort of violet laser stuff, like sort of writing on um, glow in the dark material or pointing it at uh, white lead phosphor. The beam shape is a bit asymmetrical, about maybe sort of three or four millimetres wide. So I'm guessing this is probably diode rather than uh, DPSS. A USB mini on the back, so I presume that's for doing uh, firmware updates and remote control and the coax, which I'd imagine is for uh, modulation, which neither of which are used in this application. Um, there, there are a range of these lasers. Quite a neat thing is the uh, the front shutter. They actually have different color anodizing to show the actual laser color. So if you've got a few of them, they look uh, look quite cute. There's um, a beam shutter as well on there. So we can see this is a diode laser. You can actually just see the. Um, back of the diode is just visible, it's attached to some flex and it mounts onto this chunky brass plate there's a little temperature sensor in there looks like it's mounted on a Peltier first temperature stabilisation a lens in front of it and then there's this beam splitter that's firing some of its output into this sensor so it can do closed loop um, output power control there's a 15 way connector on here methods of like setting the output power level, um, monitoring etc it's for first board, just uh, power stuff. And the interface board, there's a processor on there. Um, RS232 transceiver, so it's probably RS232 on here. And just some analog stuff on, the, on this board. So, another big pile of uh, laser fluidics, optical stuff. I'll probably be putting some of this stuff on eBay in a little while. If there's anything you're specifically interested in, please get in touch with an offer. Incidentally, I've added a few more items of merch since the uh, video I did a while ago announcing it. Um, there's now some uh, hoodies, water bottles and even a surface mount pillow.